Last time, we talked about killer clowns, bloodsuckers, and girls who dressed up like bears. Psychos come in all shapes and sizes, so today, we have another wave of crazy characters to talk about. Before we get into it though, if you enjoy this type of video, be sure to subscribe for more and let me know what psycho you want me to include in the third video. Part 1 will be linked in the description below and pinned as a comment just in case you missed it. This video does contain spoilers, but most of these series have been over for a few years, so hopefully we are in the clear. But for now, let's get into another group of psychos, and joining me today we have one of my best friends on YouTube, Nexi Boy, who will be talking all about Bond Druid and Made in Abyss later in this video, so be sure to stay tuned. But anyway, let's -a go! Psychos are always super interesting characters. They can add so much tension to a scene that every time they are on screen, you just start feeling nervous, but weirdly excited. Or maybe that's just me and I'm clinically insane. And one of the most entertaining ways to design a psycho is by making them overpowered. Making someone unstable and unstoppable makes every possible moment feel like there's infinite possibilities. Now add those traits to an immortal vampire, make them the protagonist and give them some phenomenal music and you get yourself an instant anime classic. And all that brings us to Alucard and Helsing. The Helsing organization deals with eliminating vampires and other supernatural threats. And their secret weapon in their fight is ironically the strongest vampire of them all, Alucard. Just looking at this dude can kind of give you the type of character he is. He wears these blood red clothes, and they are almost always paired with a set of Shao Tucker glasses and a truly insane smile. Alucard is brimming with confidence, he knows that he can't be stopped, and purposely makes himself stand out as much as possible because of that. Honestly, the only other character in this series that really gets even close to matching up to Alucard is Alexander Anderson, another complete nutcase. But we aren't here for his life story and style choices, let's talk about some of his crazy moments. Every fight this dude is in ends in the most brutal way he can manage it. When he kills someone, he often shoots them in their non-lethal spots, aiming to cripple and humiliate them before before he goes in for the kill. He is constantly taunting and belittling his opponents just to show that it doesn't matter. In fact, his favorite way to kill someone is to let them blow him to shreds, followed by him fully healing in a super dramatic way. Luke gets into a spot that makes it seem like he has victory in his hands, followed by Alucard transforming into a hellhound and shooting off both of Luke's legs. He tells Luke to regenerate and get back up to keep fighting. When Luke is unable to do so, Alucard devours him. This guy is brutal, immortal, nearly all-powerful, and completely off his rocker. And honestly, that's what made Helsing such a great series. While we are on the topic of savage fighters, it would be a downright crime to not talk about Majin Vegeta. Throughout Dragon Ball Z, we kinda saw him grow in waves, jumping between becoming more human and being a complete psychopath. He begins as the prince of a warrior race, destroying planets and savagely beating down the Z fighters. But it was a really interesting thing to see the Saiyans on screen for the first time. Nappa came on like this berserker, rushing down and destroying everything in his path, but Vegeta was different. He was cold, collected, and in control. He would kill anyone in his way, but he did it in a very nonchalant way. The Z fighters are in his path, but if Nappa wants to have fun, well, it doesn't make a difference who kills them after all, as long as they die. But when Nappa is unable to do so, and is no longer useful, he is immediately disposed of. Nappa was his partner, and one of the few remaining Saiyans, and yet, Vegeta killed him without a second thought, because he was weak. Vegeta never acts unless it is needed, but when he does, he never hesitates to kill. We watched the Prince of the Saiyans be beaten by Goku in the Saiyan Saga, straight up killed by Frieza when he couldn't become a Super Saiyan, and the Cell Saga was an absolute travesty for him. He finally becomes a Super Saiyan, and 18 dislocates his arm. He manages to beat Cell, and then his pride forces him to allow Cell to transform. And after that transformation, he gets his ass whooped. To say he couldn't get a break is an understatement. Throughout these arcs, we see Vegeta become more human, he gets a family, he becomes a lot more like Goku. Even though he is still a proud and ruthless Saiyan, you can tell that deep down he had started to change. And that leads us to the Buu Saga. Vegeta finally snaps and basically sells his soul to the devil so that he can defeat Goku. He shows up at the world tournament and when Goku hesitates to fight him, he fires energy blasts into the crowd, killing dozens of people. If the Cell Saga had Vegeta become more humble and humane, then the Buu Saga saw him throw it all away. Vegeta goes absolutely crazy, willing to kill anyone, throw away his family, and even his life. If it would mean him finally getting out of Goku's shadow. That being said, this craziness is pretty short-lived, but it's still pretty damn iconic. Next up, let's talk about the villain that has the best, um, hand on being a psychopath. It's always the most frightening when a crazy person is living in the middle of society as a normal guy. 
Kira is a serial killer living in the town of Mirio during JoJo's Part 4. He has this small hobby of killing beautiful women and taking their hands as a souvenir. But the real issue is that people just won't leave him alone. Like yeah, he kills people from time to time, but he just wants to live a normal life and keep to himself. Again, excluding that minor murder and amputation hobby, I think one of the most interesting things about Kira was this balancing act between a ruthless killer and a quiet homebody. As the story goes on, he finds himself literally taking over someone else's life, living with a wife who Adamak has weekly wet dreams about, and a son. The amount of time that goes by where Tira is just able to blend in and be unnoticed, and while there was definitely a lot of crazy going on before becoming someone else, there was a shift. He became frantic and more desperate. He would do anything to get his control back. Watching him play with the minds and emotions of those around him was almost a scary thing. And the last arc of the series just really shows us the extent to which he would go to in order to stay alive. The guy literally blows up time just to mess with a little kid. Speaking of messing with kids, we have Bone Drood. And I'm gonna let Nuxy Boy take this one away. Yo, Brigo! Thanks for having me do this fam! As a uh, bit of a psycho connoisseur, I was definitely honored and pleasantly surprised <laughs> to talk about some psychos in anime. I was told, oh, I can only talk about one psycho, this is so sad! As someone who relates to psychotic anime characters, and someone who made an entire top 100 anime characters list, which Briggs was kind enough to point out that, in fact, most of the characters on my list are nuts! Thanks, Briggs, very cool! Love you too, bro! So, the mad lad asked me to talk about Bone Drew from Made in Abyss. Now, let's preface by saying, I don't want to sound biased or anything, but Bone Drood is one of my favorite anime characters of all time. He is one of the five greatest antagonists in all of anime. Yes, you heard me say it, and he's nuts, and he's beautiful. So, I don't want this to be taken out of context at all, because, well, the internet seems to be relatively good at that, but Bone Drood is introduced at the end of season one of Made in Abyss, an anime that everyone should watch, and no Briggs, I did not overhype it, it's actually amazing. In the actual anime, and I will try not to spoil any major scenes, Bone Drood essentially experiments on children that he picks up off the street because, well, no one knows about them, no one cares about them, and no one will scream if they go missing mysteriously. So he gathers these children, promising them a life of warmth and care. And, well, let's just say he kind of, uh, experiments on them. Now, in the world of Maiden Abyss, there's this massive chasm called the Abyss. And aside from having wondrous creatures and amazing things down there, like crazy relics, some supernaturally type stuff, there's also a lot of messed up crap going on. And the deeper you go into the Abyss, the more messed up things get. Now, I could talk about Maiden Abyss for an hour, and uh, Briggs probably wouldn't want me to do that <laughs> in this video, but in order for Bone Drew to test out certain hypotheses he had and how to use the curses of the Abyss to his advantage, he got these kids to kind of help him out. And uh, one of his experiments seemed to be going awry for most cases and turned the child into a meat blob. Now, I say meat blob in only the kindest way, of course, because the meat blob is sitting there quivering in excessive extreme pain for the rest of eternity. But due to what Bone Drood was actually experimenting on, the meat blob regenerates and is immortal, as well as loses its sanity. This human gets completely dehumanized by this experiment. And not only that, but while this human is in constant agony, this human will be in constant agony for eternity, because he's immortal and regenerates. It is literally the saddest thing ever to happen to somebody, and the fact that the anime goes out of its way to make you emotionally attached to certain characters that get meat blobified is the saddest thing ever. Bone Drew doing this for the sake of science and actually putting a morally just spin on everything just makes him one of my favorite psychos in anime. He is so twisted, but he also genuinely believes he's doing the right thing. And you want to hear the real beauty of Bone Drew? His amazingness of his character only shows up in the manga, in the arc that's just gotten a movie adaptation in Japan, but you can't actually find anywhere. This is one of my favorite arcs of all time, and it really shows you the depths of the insanity Bone Drew has. Because the thing is, about this mad lad. He genuinely cares about these children like his own children. He cares about them so deeply, but his entire worldview has been so skewed by the insane amounts of mental struggle he had to go through. You don't understand that these children, at least a lot of them, that really look up to him like their father, are willing to do anything, no matter how much suffering for him. They are willing to do it for this genuine, amazing person, at least in their eyes. But looking from an outside you get to see the real insanity.
identity that goes on behind the mask of Bone Drew, one of my favorite antagonists and psychos. Definitely read the manga. Made in the Abyss manga is not overhyped. Briggs, Briggs, read the manga. The next arc is amazing. Please, Briggs. Also catch up on One Piece, you fake Chad. <laughs> Odin's also amazing. Oh, and whoever's editing this, please don't cut this out. First of all, thank you, Nox. Very cool. But also, I want to say that the last three episodes of the Made in Abyss anime were absolutely amazing. And overall, the show was definitely good. So I definitely want to check out the manga. But I will say, you are the king of overhyping shows. And overall, the anime was just good in my opinion. And it's like your top 10 favorite anime of all time. You, doesn't make sense. I think you're letting the manga affect your feelings about the anime. Now, Lord Brigo, I think you made some good points. But you probably misspoke just a little bit. So let me help you fix that. First of all, thank you, Nux. Very cool. But also, I want to say that the last three episodes of the Made in Abyss anime were absolutely amazing. Top 10 favorite anime of all time. And overall, the show was definitely good. So I definitely want to check out the manga. And yes, I have to catch up with One Piece. I'm like three chapters behind. I've been doing an entire One Piece read-through from the beginning live on Twitch in order to prep for our podcast, The One Piece Virgin. Anyway, let's jump back into it. One more on the note of dealing with kids, Orochimaru from Naruto. Now, if there is one character that looks more like a kid diddler than Hisoka, it has to be Orochimaru. On a quest to learn every kind of jutsu, Orochimaru sets out to become immortal. At the best of times, it is hard to think that Orochimaru has any empathy or cares about anyone other than himself. So at the very least, he is a sociopath. But mix sociopathic tendencies with the desire to be immortal in a world with ninja wizards and you got yourself someone truly crazy. Oroji Amaru's plan to become immortal surrounds the idea of abducting children, training them to become as powerful and dedicated to him as possible, then taking over their bodies so that he can become young again. He's basically a half snake, half diddler, and half cult leader. Also, he can throw himself up. I know that doesn't really make him crazy or psychopathic or anything, but like, people just don't talk about how gross that is nearly enough. Alright, from kid diddlers to kids, let's go to Yuno Gosai from Mirai Nikki. We find some extra reasons for her being insane towards the end of the series, but I'll avoid them because of major spoilers. The world of Mirai Nikki focuses on a group of 12 people who have cell phones and magical powers. These range from tons of different abilities, including telling the future or telling other people's futures. It was one of the most creative death game series at the time, but the part of the show that everyone seems to remember the most is without a doubt, you know Gasai. Have you ever met a guy who is hella into yandere's? Well, 9 times out of 10, this came from Yuno. This loving, overly affectionate character quickly spirals into overbearing and obsessed. And that quickly shifts into her being a complete psychopath who kills anyone and everyone who might hurt our protagonist Yuki or might stop her from being with him. But finally, we have one character and a group of people topping off this list. The absolute most crazy, insane, psychopathic character in anime has to be Goku. This bloodthirsty, battle-crazed monkey man devoted his whole life to fighting. He ignores and hits his kids. His wife goes years at a time without seeing him. He destroys mountains, cities, and even planets. Hell, he even risks the survival of not one, not two, not even five, but ten universes. I repeat, ten whole universes because he wants to fight some strong opponents. Honestly, the only people who are more crazy than Goku are probably his fans who think he could beat Saitama in a fight. On an equally serious note, we got a bonus psycho that I purposely left for the end of the video, so only the maddest of lads will get to truly understand the biggest psycho of them all. As you guys know, when Nux Taku made his top 100 favorite anime characters of all time, about 70% of them were, of course, psychos. A lot of these characters are good, but I couldn't understand why he loved them so much. And then, as he explained why he loved these characters, I started to realize it's because he relates to them in so many ways. Take Yoshikage Kira. He just wants to live a normal life despite his quirks, and to do that, he needed to stay unnoticed. Doesn't that remind you of a certain YouTuber that doesn't reveal his name or face? Even take Hisoka, you never know what side he is really on. One day he seems like the good guy, and the next he is clearly a villain. He will aid whatever side suits his interest. As I'm sure you know, Nuxy Boy has been caught up in many a controversy, hated by many, but loved by even more. One day he is bringing the community together with epic collaborations and content, and the next he is dividing us with controversy. And why does he do it? Because it is fun, he says. For the meme, he says. And even personally, I know him to be a generous and good dude who I talk to on a daily basis and love to death. 
But because I know how he could be behind the scenes, seeing his persona go wild online is even more proof of his psychopathic and sociopathic tendencies. Pair that with an insane voice and Kira-esque laugh, who I remind you was also loved and hated by many, and you got yourself the biggest psycho of them all. But anyway, what do you guys think? Who are your favorite psychopaths and would you like to see me talk about more of them in the next video? I think this could be a pretty fun series and I'd love to get you guys involved. If you guys enjoyed this one, be sure to leave a like and subscribe for more anime content. And if you want to see more from me, check out my Twitch at twitch.tv slash beastlybriggs where I do a bunch of gaming content. Or you can follow my podcast channel at twitch.tv slash rancafe where Nux, Taku, Animac, and I talk about anime once a week. We also have the One Piece Virgin podcast, which I'm going to link down below as well. Um, a huge thank you to Nuxy Boy for joining me today. Everyone give him a follow on Twitch and Twitter and on YouTube. Everything's linked down below. Finally, if you want to support this channel a little bit more, you can check out my Patreon to support me directly. Although, I finally updated my Patreon, so let me just let you guys know what I changed and how Patreon's going to be working going forward. So, if you donate to me at all and support me in any way, you get access to a new private Discord server. And I just want to let everyone who is currently already a patron know that you should join the server. I think we have 42 patrons, which is amazing, and already 30 of you guys joined the server, but there's 12 of you who are not, like, redeeming your reward. I have a post about it, so you can just go to my Patreon. But anyway, for the $1 tier, you get access to this Discord and you have your names displayed at the end of my video. Thank you so much, everyone who supports me via. And then in regards to the $2 tier, it's pretty much the same as the $1 tier, although I also say your names personally. So a huge thank you to Siren and Raphael. And then we get the $5 tier, which is very similar to the $2 tier, although you have a different role and access to different channels within the Discord. So a huge thank you to all my captains, McManga, nothing but a fan, King Osloth, Maggie, Joel Godinez, Michelle Moria, Kaido might be a dragon. And then we get the $10 tier, and this is where I really start to change things up a bit. Uh, obviously, you get all the previous rewards as well, but by pledging $10, you reserve yourself a spot in my party game streams at least once per month. This is when I play Jackbox games live on Twitch. My Twitch link is down below as well. So on that note, thank you RTL Faith, Chuya Nakahara, John Bruno, Cricket XP, Alpha Dio, Jay Kasumi, Shelly, Kalista, Kaiser Runar, Terra Shift, Gamer, Ya Boy Shinji, Nicholas Ramirez, Soul Slayer, Jakeman951, Greg, Ginko Taku, and then we have our $25 tier, the Absolute Mad Lads and Yonko. Um, obviously, you get all the previous rewards as well, but by pledging $25, you reserve yourself a spot and get first priority in my party game streams at least once per month. But most likely more, I've been doing it like once a week at this point. You can also join me in a Discord call while playing. And this may be limited to the last couple games of the stream, because sometimes I stream for three hours, and then maybe I will do the Discord call with you guys for the last 45 minutes. But on that note, thank you so much to Steelers, Rusty Lee, Tyson Quirino, the fifth Yonko, and some guy 9393. Thank you so much, everybody. And on that note, I will see you guys all next time. Shimpaku. Bye.